Okay, excellent. Now, it's with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce um, Gloria S. S sorry, Isagbona um, for volunteering to present her session on the She Campaign Innovative Obstetric Critical Care Training Program to Reduce Maternal and mortali um, Mortality and Morbidity. Gloria is a UK obstetrician and gynaecologist, educator and founder director of the Institute for African Women's Health and for the longest time she's been driven to do something about improving women's health. Ever since seeing a friend's sister and a cousin die in childbirth, um, where one minute they were alive and healthy and the next minute they were gone. She later trained to become an obstetric fistula surgeon and was struck by the terrible injuries inflicted on mothers that left them incontinent, unable to have sex or walk. The inequities of all this deeply affected Gloria and especially once she realised how many maternal deaths and injuries were totally preventable and could strike mothers at any time regardless of social status. She didn't want to do something that had no longevity or sustainability. She really wanted to keep African women healthy and hence the institute was founded. The first interprofessional body where all key stakeholders have an equal voice and role especially the women themselves who are at the centre and design of the programs and have equal validity. So with um, nothing further for me, I'd love to hand over to Gloria um, to, for a very interesting session. Welcome, Gloria. <coughs> thank you very much, um, Gillian, and um, thank you to the um, virtual team for allowing me this second opportunity to talk about um, the SHE campaign and maternal mortality and morbidity in Africa. Um, so um, I've had a fantastic introduction. I don't have to say much about myself, but I do want to talk about um, this concept, which is she, um, and I'm hoping that you will understand it as we go through the presentation. So um, she was already started once I became an obstetric fistula surgeon, so an injury which damages mothers because of childbirth. Um, and I came across mothers such as this woman here who uh, wasn't dead, but for me she was as good as dead. Um, because socially and psychologically she'd been so traumatized by her birth experience. And having taken this photo and having looked at it several times, I just thought this is mad. You know, this was taken, I think, in 2007. MAD stands for mothers are dying. How can mothers still be dying in this day and age when we know what to do to prevent it? So I found it um, completely crazy that we should still be in this situation. Um, and then what was also um, quite concerning for me was um, doing quite a lot of voluntary work um, in Africa. Um, I come across quite a lot of women and quite a, a lot of institutions. And in one such institution, um, I came across a, a room which was really darkened. And in the local language, um, there were words written which translated meant the wards for those with no hope. And when I went in there, I, I expected to see women who were maybe lepers or had these really incurable diseases, but there were just mothers who had given birth or maybe hadn't even given birth, but they had completely preventable conditions, but they'd been pushed so far in terms of their physiology that um, nothing could be done for them and they were just left there to die. And that was, for me, really troubling and really concerning. Um, so having worked in this space for a number of years, um, I, I finally realized Actually, I think one of the reasons why we're maybe not tackling what's happening in Africa and maybe the rest of the developing world at the moment, and even in, in the US where maternal rate, maternal mortality rates are now going up, is because we're seeing this as a really complex problem. And for me, as an obstetrician and gynecologist, or even I like to call myself an obstetric midwife, um, for me, the problem is really, really simple. Um, the WHO likes to talk about the fact that women die because of ruptured uteruses, but for me, the ruptured uterus causes her to hemorrhage, and that's the reason why she dies. They talk about obstructed labor, killing mothers, um, but obstructed labor kills a mother because she gets an infection or she hemorrhages. Um, unsafe abortion or septic abortion is still a big problem because she has an infection. Um, and then you have all of these other conditions, such as sickle cell disease, HIV, diabetes. All of them, once again, stem from the fact that the mother is dying because either she has sepsis or she has hemorrhage or she has preeclampsia or eclampsia. Um, and this is how she really came about because I felt, well, if I can collapse the reasons why women are dying down to three really simple things, it should be really simple to address those issues. Um, so she stands for sepsis or infection. 
and you can see with the image, um, sepsis is at the bottom because usually it's an ascending infection, um, which then travels up through the through the woman's body um, and causes morbidity and mortality. Hemorrhage, um, and then eclampsia or preeclampsia. So she for me is really significant, and this really has been my message. I mean, I've been working in this space for, I think, close to 15 years now. But I think in the last few years, since I started using the word she, it really has opened a lot of doors on so many different levels because people just get it. They understand that it can be very simple to prevent these things. So if you collapse the reasons why women die from a WHO point of view um, into those she conditions, then you'll find that roughly 27% of deaths and morbidities are due to hemorrhage of some sort. 33% um, are due to preeclampsia and eclampsia. And actually, if you look at it by institution, eclampsia actually plays a, a, a bigger role than we um, previously suspected. Um, and then here, this is not a, a misprint. The S isn't missing. I, I use this slide just to illustrate that when I go around and I talk about she, people often tell me, well, we don't have sepsis in our institution. That's not a big issue for us. It's hemorrhage and eclampsia. But around the world, people have started to realize that sepsis is a big killer. Even in the West, the Western countries have now started their World Sepsis Day and they've got their sepsis campaigns. People are beginning to realize how it can sometimes be such a big killer and it underpins so many other conditions. So that's the reason why we have the underscore and the she campaign, um, just to signify that sepsis has to be thought of as part and parcel of what's going on with those conditions. Um, and it really plays a big part in hemorrhage and eclampsia. So if I just use an example um, as to why I feel the conditions are really significant and why they really do need to be handled and tackled and understood together. If you think about a woman who has high blood pressure, but then she hemorrhages, and she hemorrhages because she's got high blood pressure, maybe because her clotting is off, she's more likely to hemorrhage. The two conditions go together. Let's say, for instance, she, she hemorrhages, but her blood pressure is so, so high that you haven't recognized that actually her blood pressure is now dropping. That also becomes significant. Um, it's known that sepsis can sometimes initiate preeclampsia. Studies have shown that. It's known that women that have chronic hypertension have a greater chance of becoming preeclamptic and eclamptic, and the progression of sepsis for those women are higher. So this is just to illustrate to you how important these conditions are, are and how they all relate together. Um, so the aim of the SHE campaign is that we really want to stop women being pushed to the physiological limits. We know in Africa and in most other settings, when women come and they die, it's because we've pushed them so far that even if we put these women with sepsis, hemorrhage, and eclampsia who are really sick in the best unit that there was around the world, they still would not make it because they've been pushed too far. So the aim of my campaign really is to really recognize these women quite early and catch them early on before they get pushed too far and then you can't bring them back. Um, so the way that um, I have done this since 2013 is with a matrix or algorithm called TUA, which stands for Critical Help Early for Women in Africa. And um, I, I developed a matrix because um, having worked in this space for some time, I often like to use this term, um, which is the problem that we have with research in maternity care is that we often talk about sensitivity. Um, does a woman have a condition? Yes, we know that women have problems with maternal mortality and morbidity. Um, but that seems to be the rampant cry. Um, we focus so much on the fact that, yes, we've got one woman dying every minute, or now it's one woman dying every two to three minutes. Um, and the whole rhetoric is really, really sensitive, which is important. We need to draw if, um, attention to the issue. But then the specificity um, often is lacking because, you know, we now have a specific problem. We have to be really specific about how we're going to tackle it. Tackling it with just saying women are dying and how we we have to be really sad about it is not going to work. And that's the reason why we still have so many women dying in Africa today. Um, so I say we need to move away from too much sensitivity and let's start getting more specific about what we need to do. And that's what the She campaign um, really is about. So um, I wanted to deliver critical care within the African context. For these women that were really sick, sepsis, hemorrhage, and eclampsia, who were coming and they were dying because staff felt they didn't have the equipment, they didn't have the knowledge in, in how to manage them, they didn't have intensive care. Um, and I knew that opening an intensive care unit, in, even in the biggest hospitals, would not be possible. It wouldn't be feasible. So we need to have a really low resource system um, where we could deliver um, critical care um, for these mothers so that they didn't die and that their babies were not affected. 
Um, and then also we needed a system whereby um, we could start to recognize these women, um, really talk about the physiology, because that was really important, and also manage the woman. And then also really importantly, think about prevention, because I'm not about picking up the pieces. I'm tired of sitting down as an obstetrician or an obstetric midwife, waiting for women to come damaged, sick, when I know I could have prevented it out there in the community. So I'm really about um, prevention. And this is what um, Chua and she is, is about as well. Um, so to achieve this, it was very clear that we needed processes and pathways by which women would be identified and sent to the right place. We needed the right team of people talking to one another. It had to be an interprofessional team. And the midwife was key to being part of that team. And then we needed good documentation and communication pathways. So this was um, what we developed with the, with the Chua matrix. So in critical care, um, those of you who um, are up to date with how we kind of manage resuscitation situations, we'll know about the A, B, C, D, E. Um, but I'll just go through it really quickly here. So A stands for airway, B, breathing, C is circulation, D is damage, E is exposure. And then I've added into TUA F, which stands for fetus. Because for me, the biggest killer of these mothers sometimes can be their babies. We haven't done something to maybe deliver the baby and give the mother the best chance. But equally, mothers can sometimes be the biggest killer of their babies as well. So F had to be there. And so with the algorithm, we teach people to think about each of these um, sections of the airway, breathing, and circulation systematically. So you have to deal with the airway first because of course, if the mother doesn't have an airway and she's completely blocked off, no oxygen, then there's no point trying to mop up the blood because she's coming with hemorrhage. You have to be really systematic. So we teach that. But we teach in a really logical way, which is, OK, what are the critical observations that you need to think about? Um, and the critical observations, um, for me, um, there's several. But the three key ones are respiratory rate, pulse, and the temperature. And the reason why these three, for me, are really important to start with is that we do not need equipment. And in Africa, sometimes, especially in the health centers where people say there's no batteries, no equipment, it stops them from doing basic observations that would alert them that the woman has a problem. So always they start with these basic observations and then do something about it. So you want to help the woman, um, and you want to help her by just thinking about giving her three main things that she's going to need. She's either going to need oxygen, she's going to need some form of fluid, or to have fluid taken in the form of um, blood, or she needs medication or drugs of some sort. So just think about those three things. Um, and then E stands for early intervention. So how early do you have to give these three things? Um, and what do you have to do with them? Do you have to open the airway to give the oxygen? Do you have to position her? Do you have to physically give oxygen if you can do that? Or do you have to adjust the fluid, stop them all together? Do you have to take blood? Um, do you have to give her medication, stop the medication? So it was just a very simple matrix to introduce midwives who started on this program to critical care in a way that they could really start to build their knowledge. We were trying to get them to deliver critical care competencies within four to five days instead of the usual six to 12 months that it takes around you know, the rest of the world. Um, and actually, we've managed to achieve that in, in three hospitals. So it does work. Um, then the rest of the matrix really is about what comes after. So it's not about these women coming and then saying, OK, fine, we've saved the mother. We really want people to start thinking about why did that happen? What's underlying the change in the physiology? So it's kind of like self-reflection. Um, why did it happen? Who was involved? When did it happen? Was it an antenatal problem? Was it postnatal? Was it intrapartum? Uh, and then the A stands for, you know, what's your goal? So for instance, we might have a, a, an audit meeting looking at all of the preeclamptics within four weeks. Um, you want to basically look at the critical observations, you know, what help was given, what was the intervention. You want to think about who was involved, when did it happen. And then you want to say, okay, fine, for the next month before we come back, this is what this is our goal. We want to try and reduce the mortality and mobility rate by this amount. And we want to allow, um, we want to, um, we, we need to allow certain things to happen, you know. So, for instance, maybe it's because we didn't have an anesthetist or maybe we didn't have a midwife or the midwife wasn't allowed to work or she wasn't paid. What do we need to allow? Um, and then all of this goes into an audit. So this is a really simple overview um, of the matrix. I don't have time to go into it in great detail, but just to give you an idea of how we start to break down understanding um, of those shoe conditions and how to manage them. So um, like I said, we have um, delivered this within three hospitals across Africa to date. Um, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Malawi. Um, and this was the first program in November 2013. And the unit is still going strong, having 
saved um, hundreds upon hundreds of women and their babies. Um, and then recently, um, she and Chua has now gone to Pumwani, which is the third, third biggest maternity hospital in Africa. It delivers about 100 babies um, a day. And then um, after that, Lagos Island Maternity Hospital, which is nicknamed the Baby Factory of Africa. So this picture is from Lagos Island Maternity, which I really count as one of my great success stories, just because the team that came along, and this is a bunch of midwives here, were so proactive in taking it forward and really realizing that vision for she. So here you can see midwives helping one another um, with resuscitation. Um, a key part of um, each of these units where this has been set up is what we call the early warning score. So the early warning score um, is a way of recognizing the woman based on their observations. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see A, B, C, D, E. Um, so the observation is broken down. And then you basically take the observations on the mother um, and then from there decide whether they're normal or they're abnormal and you give a score. So for instance, if she had a post of 69, you say, okay, she's got a score of zero. Um, so this is a really quick way of scoring the woman. And um, the problem that we have in Africa is that sometimes the ratio of staff to patients can be so great. Sometimes you have two staff to 100 patients. So it's not possible to go to every single patient and score them. And of course, you might not have the equipment, for instance, to do an oxygen saturation. So what I say to people is that, look, just start by saying, does the patient look unwell? Does she feel sick? Are you worried about the patient? And that's how you start your handover. Any patient that you're worried about, that's the patient that you should try and score as completely as you can. Um, so this is what patient, this is what staff have started doing in each of these units now. And I think this is the reason why their mortality has really, really dropped, because they are recognizing the woman early, stopping them being pushed so far in their physiology and bringing them back and then managing them with the resources that they have. Um, so you can see here um, um, observations which are higher than they're, they're supposed to be have higher scores. Um, and then observations which are lower than they have to be also have higher scores. So sometimes you can have a patient that comes in with a score maybe of nine. So she might have a respiratory rate of 24, but her, her blood pressure might be 160. That gives her a score of four. She looks extremely sick. Um, sick. That gives her a score of two. So she has a score of six. Um, maybe she looks really confused. Another score that gives her eight. Um, and maybe her temperature is really low, less than 36. That gives her a score of three. So that's a score of 11. So she has a score of 11. And also what's really unique about this score. So this early warning score system is something which has been used around the world in many obstetric units and even non-obstetric or maternity units um, as a way of recognizing the patient. But what they did in Lagos Island's maternity in their critical care unit that they call LIMCU or their service was they also put symptoms on there because they recognized that sometimes patient um, staff did not take the observations either because they were busy or they didn't have the equipment. But symptoms were very easy to score. So they actually put symptoms on there. And I think this will make a really big difference in our SHE campaign going forward because um, we aim to go into the communities to use this kind of score system with people who have no clinical background whatsoever. Um, and we want to kind of make it very visual and based on symptoms and get them scoring the mothers that way and knowing where to refer them. So that insight that I got from um, Lagos Island Maternity um, has been really great in sort of establishing a sort of new way forward for the SHE campaign. So once they've scored the patient, what they do, um, they now use what we call a track and trigger to now decide what happens with the patient. So if the patient has a score of zero to two, as you can see on the left, then it's OK, this patient is fine. She can go home. Um, but if the patient now has a score of three to five, this is an unwell patient. And basically, they're, they're triggered to do something. So either in the hospital, they're told what the, who needs to go and see the patient, or if they're outside the hospital, in the private hospitals, um, they're told how, how soon they have to get the patient in. And this is really significant because um, one of the reasons, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard about the three delays, one of the reasons why many women die is because there's been a delay in getting them the help that they need. Um, and even when I went to Lagos, I was quite surprised to find that there are many private providers who still sit on these women for hours and hours, if not days, before referring them in quite um, late to places like Lagos Island. By that time, it's too late to do anything for them. But we felt with numbers, it was like a common language everyone could understand. If you're sitting on a woman with a score of six to eight, you know that the chance that that woman is not going to make it or the outcome will be bad is quite significant. You have no excuse for not referring the patient. So we want people to really start talking with a, with a common language and in numbers. And that really is making a big difference. So 
to sit on a patient with a score of 15 is completely unacceptable. And in Lagos Islands now, they have started to audit their figures for the past month, and they're finding that the patients who are coming to them now have scores of 15. But quickly with intervention, they're actually bringing those scores down to 9 to 6 to 8. So it's making a big difference. And whereas before they were having significant numbers of deaths because of late referrals, actually for the past few weeks, those deaths have gone down by 90% um, with the TUA and the SHE system. So as I explained to you, the reason why um, this TUA system and having that score system and really concentrating on SHE is really significant is that you can quickly pick out those women who are really sick. So for instance, in this ward, which is really overcrowded. How do you know a woman is sick when you're the only midwife looking after 50 women? It can be really difficult. Um, but when you start with that question, is there any woman that I'm worried about, any woman that's sick, let me just go and pick her out, let me just do as, what observations I can do, it makes such a big difference. So that's what um, has started to happen in the free hospitals. So this picture illustrates um, how we pick up some of these women. So I happen to have a pulse oximeter where I can sort of test the oxygen levels in the woman's blood. And you can see here, her oxygen level is 85, which is way, way too low. You can look at the urine, which is what I call coke colored. So that's another way that I sort of teach people to identify the sick patient. Does the patient look like coke, Fanta, or Sprite? This was a patient who was very, very sick with sepsis and also had um, preeclampsia as well. Um, she luckily made it um, because we picked her up quite early. Now, when we deliver the training, we are very hands-on and very practical. We do not believe in sitting these midwives um, that you can see here, um, and Miata, who was my trainer from the UK, a, a, a critical care trained midwife. We don't believe in sitting them down in the room for four to five days and teaching them by PowerPoint. It doesn't make any sense. They need to be out there because we know as we're sitting in that room, there are women languishing around the hospital that need help. So we were very, very hands-on. So this was in Malawi, Queen Elizabeth very, very hands-on in teaching them from day one how to manage the patient um, at the bedside. The other thing that they had to do, and the midwives are so great at this, you can see here on the left the medical director in Lagos Island Maternity, Donald Mosemi, who's been such a fantastic champion, um, and then one of our young midwives who is now staffing the, the LIMCU, LIMCU unit, the Lagos Island Maternity Critical Care Unit and Service, looking at all of these observation charts that I brought from around the UK, um, because I was very mindful of the fact that if you want people to use things, they have to understand it, they have to design it themselves, and it has to fit their context. So I never go into any of these hospitals and say, look, this is the documentation you're going to use, this is how you have to communicate. They have to work out that for themselves, because then they're more likely to sustain it. And that's what they did in Malawi, it's what they did in Kenya, and it's what they've done in Nigeria. And I think this has been critical to making such a big difference. You can see them really looking at all of these observation charts and working out how to design their own observation charts. Um, here is a consultant anesthetist, um, and to his left you can't see there's a midwife. To have a midwife and a doctor sitting side by side designing guidelines is not something that happens very often in Africa, especially if you're not like a, a senior matron or you're not in a school. You just don't get that opportunity to sit down, share your experience, and work on something um, with a common agenda. But here, the team actually have to sit down together and build the algorithms and the guidelines for managing these patients. Um, and that makes, makes a big difference. Um, and you can see here um, people building guidelines on the wall. So this is, this is a pharm pharmacist working with midwives to build the sepsis guideline. And to help them, I just bought lots of guidelines that I got off the internet, um, told them this is what this hospital does in the UK, this is what they do in the States, this is what they do in Australia, this is what they do in Sydney, this is what they do in Italy. Um, look through it, cut cut and paste, stick them on the wall, and come up with your own guideline. And, and this is the reason why they're able to do the documentation and the guidelines and everything else really quickly within three to four days, because they're building it themselves from scratch in a really simple way. Similarly here, you can see in this picture um, a midwife, Weze Ngungwe, who's now head of the Safe Motherhood Unit in Malawi, on her hands and knees, building the observation chart that would aid referral from the health center to the main hospital, Queen Elizabeth. So it really is a very hands-on interactive um, program. Um, and this slide basically just demonstrates what a critical care unit looks like. So this is the one in Lagos Island where they've got four beds and they've broken the beds down by the score of the patient. Um, and then opposite those four beds, they have patients who are maybe not scoring as highly but need to have um, a closer eye kept on them just so that they don't um, sort of get worse. 
Um, but in Lagos Island, they quickly realized, because they get so many bad referrals, they quickly realized that they could not just offer a unit. Um, and this is the reason why I love the team so much. They said, no, Gloria, we have to offer a critical care service at the bedside so that, you know, we can give that service to women wherever they are in the hospital. So that's what they did. They, did, they designed pathways and flowcharts so that even if you were not critical care trained, you could step by step, know, step by step know what to do um, for the mother. And that really has made a big difference. Um, so I'm really, really proud of, um, of the LIMCU unit, which has been staffed um, and headed mainly by a, a chief midwife and her team, but with support from the obstetrician and the anesthetist. Um, and you know, a key part of she and Chua is, like I said, prevention. We rarely want to prevent these women getting sick in the first place. And the key part of that is avoiding cesarean inceptions. As an obstetrician, I have to say that, especially when it comes to sepsis and hemorrhage, avoid the cesarean inception like the plague, because the chances that you get sepsis, especially if you have HIV or you're diabetic or you, you're sickler, is just so high. I've seen so many terrible cases, especially among very young girls, um, that I try my best to really implant the prevention of those um, conditions on the labor ward intrapartum. So I'm very pro-vaginal birth, where it is safe, where it isn't safe, cesarean inception. And then, even then, the process has to be quite tightly regulated. Um, so these are just a few more pictures that are showing you she. You can see her mother and child. You try and keep mother and child very close together. For me, that's really, really important. Um, and I think this process has really, I mean, I don't think it's something you can teach, you know, to have empathy for your patients. But you can see her, Sylvia Mitengo, um, in the Malawi unit, the empathy that she's displayed for her patients. I mean, she's still working there now since November 2013. Sometimes she does 24, 48 hours. She is so strong, and she's such a good example as a midwife. Um, and I think she's the one that really spurred me on to keep going. Um, and now my plan is to use her as a trainer for other midwives across Africa to really embed this. So she has really made a big difference for mothers. Mothers are really making it. Um, you can see this mother here who, you know, I actually thought we were going to lose her. She had sepsis and hemorrhage. I thought she was she wasn't going to make it, but actually mothers are now making it because of the SHE system where we have just concentrated staff's understanding and management on just those three conditions. Um, so as I said before, I've delivered this in three units, Queen Elizabeth in Malawi, Pumwani in Kenya, and Lagos Island Paternity in Nigeria. They're seeing great results. The big issue they have is just the late referral. And this brings me on to the next part of my presentation. And I'm aware that I don't have that much time, so I'll just spend five minutes talking about the next part, which for me is the next part of the SHE campaign, prevention. Prevention and early recognition. So um, recently in the Royal College of Surgeons and Ireland's conference, they spoke about the fact that hospitals are for repairs and um, the community is where health is built. And I really do believe that. I believe that women are essentially healthy, and the, the aim of the institute is to keep them healthy. And to do that, we have to really work at the community level. We can't sit down and wait to pick up the pieces with these women, because there's only so much capacity that these um, hospitals can accommodate. So we have to deal with the late referrals, which are really significant. And she has really helped me to start tackling that late referral and the empowerment of women at the grassroots level. Um, so she has really helped me to tackle newborn mortality and morbidity. Um, I often talk to the, the champions of newborn mortality and morbidity, and I say, look, the biggest killers of these newborns or their babies are their mothers. And I don't say that in a bad way, but actually most of the babies that are in that neonatal unit or the ones that die come from those mothers that have she or mothers that have not had their she managed carefully in labor at all. So if we can tackle that, we can actually have a knock-on effect for a lot of those mothers. So a lot of these babies in the neonatal unit or the deaths are due to preterm sepsis. So if the mother has a temperature, we know the, the baby's temperature will be one degree higher, or asphyxia. Um, so if we start to tackle she, we will start to really tackle um, what um, encompasses she as well, which is the new newborn mortality. Um, so think about it. 23% complications from infections can be reduced if you start to tackle she. The asphyxia rate, which is really significant, I think it's even higher than 23% in some of the hospitals. You can see here a CTG or KTG at the back. Horrible, horrible decelerations with this baby um, because the mother has she and it's not being man managed appropriately. And then prematurity. So I spoke about F in my um, algorithm in the matrix. And I'm a big fan of delayed cord clamping or what I call placental resuscitation. 
um, the tendency is when you have a baby that's distressed or we're delivering the baby as an emergency, we just want to clamp the cord straight away, forgetting 70% of that baby's blood, if not more, is still within that placenta. So I have a big, there's a big push for me now to say, do not clamp that cord. Even if the baby is really distressed, you have the best chance, or you can give the baby the best chance by not clamping the cord. And that also has really made a big difference with a lot of these babies in the newborn unit. So this baby hair that was extremely white actually had ended up having a blood count of about 2.5, when it should have been maybe 12 or 13. Um, so um, I advocate for this, not just in Africa, but even in the UK. If there's fetal distress, please do not clamp the cord. You can resuscitate the baby on the cord and try and get as much blood in that, into that baby as possible. That really is what is needed for resuscitation. So she has really helped to open doors for me. When I started, nobody would talk to me, especially when I spoke about training midwives. They were not interested. But with that she campaign and also the the gains or the impact that I've shown in Malawi, doors have started to open. So in, 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 in Lagos, for instance, you can see here the, the medical director, Donald Imosemi, a fantastic proactive leader who galvanized a very senior team to come for training. Um, and then on the left-hand side, the, the director of medical services for the Lagos State Commission, who is so passionate about this and wants us to sit down and work out a Lagos State strategy um, to try and, try and reduce um, mortality across the whole of the region. Um, she is really well, well aware of the fact that death is just the tip of the iceberg. If there's one death, we know that there's 30 times as many near misses where women don't go home when they should, when they're in intensive care. Um, and even greater than that, morbidity in the community is huge. Many of these women that have preeclampsia, eclampsia go home with no follow-up. They come back again with preeclampsia, eclampsia. Maybe the second time they don't make it, um, they're losing their babies. So we have to tackle this at a community level. Um, and to tackle it, means that we really have to think about the state of our healthcare workers. Midwives for me are key um, because they're so close to the mother, um, but we still have a great shortage of midwives within Africa. Um, I think just today I was reading a, a, an article that said that look, we're going to have 12 million healthcare workers short by 2035, especially in the poor urban areas or in the rural areas. Uh, we don't have anywhere near where we should. WHO said that we need 230 per 100,000 head of the population. In some countries in Africa, you're lucky if you have 37 midwives per 100,000 and two doctors. It's not enough. So we have to do a lot more. And this is where the SHE campaign or fellows come in. Um, so the SHE um, fellow campaign is saying that let us start using our biggest valuable resource, which are the women themselves, and especially the adolescent girls who are more likely to get SHE conditions and also to die from those she conditions. Um, let's start to use them as community health workers. At the moment, we have community health workers who are tackling every single condition under the sun, and they're doing a fantastic job. job. But I think that we could do a lot more if we, if we were more specific, as I said before, and not just sensitive. Target these adolescent girls. Teach them about their health. What are they more likely to die of? They're more likely then not to go down that route. Um, and they can also help other mothers as well. They're young. They're fit. They can go around. They can identify these mothers really simply. Um, these she fellows, I keep saying, they may be ignorant, let's, let's educate them, but they're definitely not stupid. They're more than capable, like this group here who I was teaching about the obstetric fistula. Um, they did not know what the fistula was. They'd just been repaired, were about to go home. I put my laptop on the floor and I said, this is what your fistula looks like. And I showed them photos and videos and they were fascinated. And the discussion they had was one of the most academic discussions I've actually had the privilege to sit in on. So I feel that we can really start to use these she fellows women and especially adolescent girls to really go out there and start preventing and managing, recognizing these conditions and helping the women. Um, so all of these mothers that I've delivered, I think potentially could be she, she fellows of the institute. The institute is an academic body, but it's not just for the professionals. These women also have to be fellows um, of that institute. Um, so I think she can really do a, a fantastic job. Um, I think she's able to do a lot of prevention. I think she's able to um, avoid a lot of those conditions herself if she's educated. Um, and I think she can really start to tell us the reasons why women find themselves in these situations in the, in, in the first place. At the moment, we are very sen sensitive. We are not specific about what the actual issues are on the ground because we think we know in our infinite wisdom in our academic institution. But I think we need to really start getting close to where the problem is and, and using these women to tell us what the issues are because then we can start to build sustainable programs. So. Um, I feel that these chief fellows, even if they can't read, they can't write, they haven't gone to school, they can actually start to work in these really hard-to-reach spaces 
in the rural areas and the poor urban areas that qualified professionals will want to go to and they can really be a great asset to our service. Um, they can do simple things like identifying anemia. So you can see my thumb at the bottom and you can see it's, it's blanched a little bit because I'm pressing down on her eyelid, but even then it's not completely white. This woman has completely white membranes. She's anemic. This is something that she fellows have started picking up for me themselves. They've got eyes they can see. Um, this is sepsis, and um, this is a, what I like to call a sheath fellow, um, a relative who was a, 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 quite a, a young adolescent boy who was dressing his mother's wounds um, with brown sugar. So this is something that can be done in the community because one of the big issues I found is that when you have a woman with sepsis, the tendency in some hospitals is that they say, okay, she's got sepsis, we're going to go in and do an operation again. They cut her open. Even if they find nothing, they think, oh, the sepsis must be coming from the uterus. The uterus comes out. She has a hysterectomy, sometimes at the age of 17, and she has a dead, dead baby to boot as well. So I'm very keen on avoiding the severe inception. But if she gets sepsis, let's try and be conservative. Um, and um, conservative is, con conservatism can actually be achieved within the community as well. So brown sugar has been known for decades to treat infections. And the way it works is you've got bacteria eating away at the skin. Give it sugar to feed on instead. It leaves the skin alone, gives it time to heal. So brown sugar is what a lot of relatives are using now to good effect in a number of the programs I've set up. And it work, helps a lot. And of course, they do a lot. They look after these babies anyway. Just teach them. Don't keep them ignorant about keeping the baby warm, keeping the cords OK. They can do a lot. So there are many things that these she, she fellows could do to contribute towards the system. And I think she will do that, but she needs something. And at the moment, community health workers are left in limbo. We don't pay them. They're volunteers. And of course, they have to survive. They have to eat. So they often do other jobs. And therefore, it means that sometimes they overlook sometimes the symptoms and signs that these women have. Um, my aim is that these adolescent girls actually should get paid. They should get some kind of salary. They should get some kind of security. Um, and along the way, in understanding what these she conditions are and helping these women to um, recognize and manage them, um, they get to understand their health, they contribute towards the health system, and they also get education at the same time, because what we will be giving them is health literacy, which is almost like a gateway sometimes for them in becoming literate in other areas as well. So salary, health, and education also spell she, and that's our aim now, to work with partners to start coming up with community health programs, employing these adolescent girls almost as interns, either a few years, if they want to continue and go on to become midwives or continue as community health workers, that's fine. But it gives them a, a gateway and an, an understanding and a contribution towards their societies. So that's the aim of the She campaign. And my question to you is, what do you think she can do? Um, because you know we've got lots of ideas of how we can start to fund this campaign and get these social enterprises started. Um, get these women paid, get them generating their own incomes within the community, and at the same time, they're delivering a vital part of the health service. But we need ideas, um, and we need your support. So my details are here. Um, I'm happy to have a discussion with you now um, about um, how you think um, this SHE campaign would work. I, I'd be happy to speak to you privately by email. You can follow us on Twitter um, or follow me at my personal Twitter thinking box. Um, and yeah, please tweet about what we're trying to do, the SHE campaign. We're really trying to build this movement. I think it has great relevance, not just for Africa, but I think all over the world where people are struggling to finance the health system. And I think community support and prevention is key, I think, to really keeping our, our populations healthy. So I think if this really takes off, and I think it will take off, um, it can really have a knock-on effect, I think, for just how we deliver health in general. Thanks, Gloria. That's an absolutely yeah wonderful presentation. Do you want to just um, yeah, finish I up? Just wanted to yeah just acknowledge um, uh, the people who I mean I couldn't have done this by myself obviously. So um, I've had quite a, a number of supporters who've really believed in she, such as Miata, Chima, um, lots of MDs from different hospitals, um, my UK colleagues such as Theo, and of course organisations such as the Virtual International Day of the Midwife for giving me this platform, British Medical Association. Couldn't have done it without them. Um, and I think if we all start to collaborate together, we can really start to make a big difference. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Gloria. As um, I said at the beginning of the presentation, there's just so much information that Gloria had to give there, and we could have easily done two or three sessions. Um, so I know that um, I know 
certainly from the comments that everyone's really enjoyed it. Is there any questions? Just we might take one or two. Yes, Maureen, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I think that's the same here in Australia. Uh, it would be great if we could concentrate more on the basics um, instead of the piles of paperwork that we have to do. I was talking to Gloria about the um, QMUTE charts, you know, the, the early warning charts that we use here. Um, and I think a lot of time is spent on, on them rather than actually looking at the woman. So I certainly think that going back to basics is very beneficial. Okay, I can see a question here from Cecilia yes. about resuscitating the preterm newborn while still attached to the cord. Um, this is not routine in the UK um, at the moment, especially when there's fetal distress. Um, optimal um, cord clamping um, has had fantastic champions in the UK, um, and it rarely is starting to spread um, in terms of sort of waiting for white, waiting for the cord to go white. Um, waiting up to three minutes, um, if possible. So I think it is starting to spread. I think my issue is um, that the key group that really do need what I call placental resuscitation are the ones that are not getting it, and, and they're the, the babies that really have fetal distress, and especially the preterm babies. We tend to just cut them off straight away, um, and um, that's one of my my big campaigns now, um, which is you know number one, slow delivery of the baby is really important but definitely keeping that baby attached to the cord as much as possible. Because I, I have found, especially in Africa, it really helps resuscitation. I've had babies who have come out with meconium, really, really sick. And just the simple process of delivering the head really slowly, putting the baby on the mother's tummy, and then not cutting that cord is enough to, the baby self-resuscitates itself, even the sickest babies, and it gives the baby the best chance. So um, I think there is a lot that we can still do um, in midwifery, and you know, I'd like to say I, I would take credit for the placental resuscitation, but of course, it's working with fantastic midwives. My sister is a midwife, um, and I've got lots of midwifery friends and colleagues. You know, just observing what they do. Um, sometimes I feel we don't understand what we do, but we do it because it it seems logical, it makes sense. Um, but having now researched it scientifically, it makes a lot of sense as well. So, yeah, I, I think in the UK we still have a, a long way to go in terms of dealing with a distressed baby, but for the baby that's not distressed. I think people are already starting to take up that message, do not cut the cord until it's turned white. Yeah, we're finding the same thing here in Australia. I, it seems such a logical thing to me. I, I'm really unsure of why there's so much resistance. So I think we're probably experiencing the same thing all around. Well, thank you very much, Gloria. I think the SHE campaign and that acronym too is just a really, really easy thing to remember. And I think we're all going to go away with that um, implanted in our brain. She can, she is able. Um, and I think, what was the third one? She is, she yeah. has, and she can. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that, Gloria. OK, so we'll just finish off with a couple of um, the final slides. I'll just end the recording.